Our first lesson today is taken from the book of Galatians, chapter 4, starting with verse 4. Following the reading, please stand for the reading of the gospel. A reading from Galatians. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our Heavenly Father, I pray as the Spirit of God moved upon the men of old to inspire and produce these words which we read this day we pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds that we may see fully what you have for us in these words i pray in jesus name amen please be seated Uh, this is uh, in tongue-in-cheek tradition what is called a low sunday And after major festivals and events, people have a tendency to recover, and they are affectionately called Low Sundays. Well, I would like to declare to you this morning that in God's mind, there's no such thing as a Low Sunday. Every Sunday is a High Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and be grateful for it. The Gospel reading uh, today starts with angels and shepherds. Angels that had appeared to lowly shepherds outside of Bethlehem on a hillside tending the sheep. And the angelic company, first of all, an angel announces to them about what's going to happen and then this angel is joined by a whole company of heavenly hosts singing and worshiping God, Hosanna in the highest. It was eternity. It was the transcendent. It was something out of this world that was breaking in on earthly history. And it was revealed first to lowly shepherds, the bottom of the totem pole in terms of social order. It wasn't the noble, it wasn't the dignified, it wasn't the kings, it wasn't people in high places, it was people in the lowest of places where God unfolds a revelation of what is occurring as Jesus enters into a time-space world and takes on humanity. Phenomenal. It was something that the shepherds weren't expected. They were just tending their business. They were out doing the ordinary, just taking care of business. 
They weren't filled with expectation. They had not been put on the alert that the Lord was about to do something spectacular. But all of a sudden, here they are being invaded by this heavenly breakthrough. And angels, an angel it says angels, but we read on it says when the angels, plural, return to heaven. So there was a whole lot of angelic activity going on. Something from out of this world that had stepped into their world and was about to transform it and make it different forever. When I was in uh, doing graduate studies at George Washington University in New Testament church history, I had a professor who was steeped in the German school of higher criticism. And when we would talk about the miraculous, and we on one occasion during our seminar that was Jesus cast out demons, and he went on to explain that if it was in our day and time that he, Jesus would have placed them on a couch and given them psychotherapy. And I said, I said, but Professor Jones, I said, it says right here in the scripture that something miraculous happened. And he looked at me with this condescending tone and he says, well, that is how the writer of the New Testament understood what was happening. And so I would go from Saturday night where we would see the Holy Spirit fall. People would come to Jesus. People would be filled with the Holy Spirit. People would be healed. And I would go into that. And I'd leave there. It's sort of a spiritual schizophrenic. I'd, I'd leave that seminar going, er, er. Because he was trying to fill my head with one thing, but my heart was filled up with something else. And that is belief in what the scripture attested to and affirmed. So I chose to believe what the scriptures had to say. And in this case, that there are angels who were sent to minister on behalf of the elect. Now, isn't that mythology? Isn't that fable? Isn't that a cute idea that we can portray with little kids with fluffy wings on Easter? No, it's a declaration of what happened in a time-space world in history when God sent heavenly beings to break in on the ordinary stuff of humans. Now, it's something interesting that after this great in, in this, uh, in, intrusion into the ordinary of these shepherds, it, the scripture says they left and they went back to heaven. You think, well, they would just stick around and be part of this great event. But what I'm hearing in that is that the message came to people who would be the ones who proclaimed it, who confirmed it, and who declared it, because God wanted people that needed a Savior to be involved in his plan of redemption. Hear me in that. The reason that the angels had finished their task was because now it was turned over to ordinary and lowly people to go and see and to bear the word and to pass it along. These were the first evangelists, by the way. And so they talk as the angels go back to heaven. I would have loved to have been around for that conversation. Because I'm sure it was exceptional. And they said, let us go, let us go quickly to see, is what the scripture here says. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The word that's translated see 
from the original Greek had more of this sense. Let us go to Bethlehem and get in on it. It wasn't just to go check it out. Let's go, let's go check it out. Let's go get in on this. Let's go get in on this. Let's be part of this. Let's get in on what's going on. That what's been told to us, let us go and get in on it. That's what I want to call a let's get in on it attitude. Hang on to that, will you? Once they arrived and they saw him, the scripture says, once they saw him, they began to talk about him. There's another key. You have to see him in order to talk about him. You have to see him with your heart. You have to see him with your spiritual eyes if you're going to be invigorated to talk about him. And that's what they did. And so they started sharing with the people around them. And the scripture says they were amazed at what they had heard. So we went from angels and shepherds to shepherds and a baby to shepherds and people to whom they delivered a message. And then finally we see them returning, glorifying and praising God for what they had heard and what they had seen. And may I add, what they had gotten in on. just as it had been told to them. To glorify God, to make glorious by bestowing honor and praise and admiration. That you glorify God by bestowing honor, by praising and by magnifying his name. You know what it means to magnify the, the name of the Lord? And it, the, it, the psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let us magnify his name and exalt his name together. What do you do with a magnifying glass? We have one on our coffee table at home. What do you do with a magnifying glass? You can talk to me. Go ahead. It makes things larger, doesn't it? So if you've got a magnifying glass, and if you're like me, I, I need one now and then. And so I pick it up and, whoa, now I can see it because I have made it larger. So to magnify the name of the Lord is to take something that may be obscure and to make it larger, to make it bigger. And so they went away magnifying the Lord making his name great, making his name larger, praising God and giving him glory. Amen. Thank you very much. Who said that? <laughs> I talk about how many times there is an amen in the liturgy. There's so many amens in the liturgy but when we're up here preaching, it is hard as the dickens to pull one of those out of you. <laughs> it's like you're telling me what's well, not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be over here. But follow the sequence. Shepherds, lowly shepherds, ordinary people that you and I could readily identify with people that would not be considered special or especially qualified or in some way particularly worthy. They were lowly shepherds that needed a savior. And that is the company that God chose to send angelic messengers with a proclamation and a declaration of what had occurred in Bethlehem. 
God become incarnate through the Virgin Mary and entered into our world to show us how to live and to be our Savior forever. And once the angels leave, they get up and say, let's go get on it. Let's get in on it. And that's what I call the let's get in on it attitude. And I would invite you to say, Lord, give me the let's get in on it attitude. Where you show up, looking up for what's coming from up into our situation, into our setting. And then when we see him, that we'll be busy talking about him and talking about what God is doing and that we will return glorifying and praising God for all that he has done. The Lord helped me to say something in a way that makes sense. <laughs> If you don't believe in angels, you can be pretty sure you're not going to experience the effect of one. If you don't believe that the activity of the Holy Spirit and the transcendent breaking into our space in our time, if you don't believe in it, you can be pretty well sure that the Holy Spirit will go find some place that does. But if we open our hearts and we say, Lord, bring it. Bring it. And whatever it is about angels, and I'm not going to talk much about angels this morning. You want to tell you why? I shout about what the scripture shouts about. I talk about what the scripture talks about. And I whisper about what the scriptures whisper about. We don't have a whole lot about angels, except they are through the Old Testament, and they are manifested in the New Testament, especially on this occasion. So I feel like I can at least talk about it, if not at least whisper about the fact that there are angels all and they are sent to minister in behalf of the elect. And I'm going to tell you, I feel like I haven't even entered kindergarten when it comes to the ministry of angels. But what I am saying this morning, angels, whatever it is that you've been sent to do for the Abbey, get loose and do it. And the mystery and the transcendent, that which is from out of this world that can be sent into this world and come into our time-space continuum and be manifest in such a way that it is palpable. I say, will you come? Holy Spirit, come and do your work. And if we're looking for you to come through the front door and you decide you want to come through the back door, give us eyes to see and ears to hear in enough sense to acknowledge it. In fact, Lord, you can do whatever you want, any way that you want. And if it doesn't come through the avenues that we've prescribed, Give us enough sense to recognize it when it happens. And then when we've seen it, when we've heard it and when we've seen it, that we talk about it. And I'm going to tell you something. When that happens, when that occurs, you don't have people getting up in Sunday morning trying to decide whether they're going to go to church or not. You don't have people say, well, you know, I've been twice this week. When 
and Sue and I were finishing, I was finishing up undergraduate work. We were in California. We were going to church where there was a move of the Holy Spirit. And every week, we, we had to drive 45 minutes to get there. But I'm telling you, we'd get up early and we would go. And one of the reasons I wanted to go was I wanted to be sure to get my seat right where Kathy Day is sitting. That's where I would sit, right there, Kathy. And I would, I would go get there early to make sure that somebody else didn't get in my seat. Because when things began and worship started, I wanted to be up there where I got the spray. And the Lord moved so powerfully in one service, all I could do was get down on the floor and crawl under the pew. I know you're saying, hmm, gee, I hope you don't do that this Sunday. But why? Because there was a compelling presence of the Holy Spirit who was moving and doing something and it wasn't a question of whether I had to go. I did not want to miss. I wanted to get in on it. We were praying this morning. And <laughs> the Lord talks to me in, it's in very simple phrases. He has to. It's the only way I get it. And I felt like something went through my heart that says, you'll be free in 23. You'll be free in 23. And I thought about Abundant Life series that's coming up. Then I thought about Russ Parker coming up, which is going to enable people to make resolution with the past and break free from things that are defining the future. And moving in to a fresh wave and a fresh move of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, I'm inviting you. That's what I'm doing. I'm not telling you anything. I'm inviting you. Let us open our hearts and say, Lord, bring from before your presence and your throne whatever is out of this world that we need in this world. We open our hearts. And Lord, we only, we don't want to just see it. We want to get in on it. And then we want to tell about it and talk about it and invite other people to come get in on it. And then come back rejoicing, glorifying, and praising God. Amen. I mean, you, you, can you sense it? It's, I feel it close. <laughs> I feel it close. There's an opportunity. Who? <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I'm getting happy. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Tonight at 5 o'clock, there's going to be an opportunity to gather for one hour to worship and reflect and Alan you, you want to say another comment about the purpose of that time from 5 to 6 this evening come and get in on it <laughs> I have a habit and a rhythm of every year just really seeking the Lord for a word or a scripture or something that would kind of dictate that year and uh, he was often faithful and Yesterday, I was thinking about that, talking to somebody, and somebody says, well, have you offered that to your congregation? And I said, well, I have now. So at 5 to 6, you're just invited to come. We're going to join together. We're going to open up his word. We'll sing some of his praises, and we'll just listen to what God has. Psalm 29, Proverbs 29 tells us that his revelation, his prophetic vision, his words, without that, then our life is empty. And so we seek that, and we'll spend an hour seeking to hear his voice for individually, as family, as a congregation, to see what he might say 
to start this new year off in that open, receiving posture. Mm -hmm. Amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You have been listening to the teaching ministry of the Abbey at Polly's Island, South Carolina. For more information on the Abbey at Polly's Island Church or for more audio, please visit our website at theabbeypollysisland.com.